Hey, this is Sebastian over at Sassy Italy Tours. We like to support the show because we think that by supporting Wine to Five, we're giving directly to people that are getting behind the scenes and giving us really good information about stuff that you're just not going to be able to find other ways. It's not five o'clock and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. We are here with Kala Maxim today, and Kala is from Five Senses Tastings. Well, I have to give credit to the Twitter sphere again. I mean, Val and I have found some cool connections on Twitter land. And Kala and I connected almost a, a year ago, dating back about August of 2016 on Twitter. And we thought that we could meet in person at Women of the Vine and Spirit Symposium, but it just didn't work out. And eventually, with persistence from both our ends, and persistence is really what Wine25 is all about. Kala was able to interview and be with us on Skype land. And she's doing something really unique and thought provoking with her business. And here's a little bit about Kala as an intro, and then you'll learn more about her in our interview. Kala's professional background includes working as a senior program analyst with the U.S. Department of Justice as a professional opera singer. A highlight was even singing at the London inaugural ball for President Barack Obama and working for a tech startup. That's all until she realized none of this is what she truly wanted to do with her life. So she quit her, quote, real job and moved to L.A. all in the same week last April and is now dedicated full time to her company, Five Senses Tastings. Kala is also a California wine appellation specialist and WSCT level one certified, hopefully level two. She took it and I'm sure she passed. And Kala is also a former bone marrow donor. So you guys will learn more about a lot of these things in our chat with her. Here is this interview. What a pleasure and a treat it is to be with you. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. So thank you so much for inviting oh, that is me so on. so cool. Thank you. Yay. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Your last life is also very interesting. <laughs> And the way you got inducted, if you will, or abducted by the world of wine, we're kind of curious. Could you tell our listeners the story of what brought you into the wine world from your last life? I can. And I, the way I was inducted into the wine world was actually um, during like three lives ago. <laughs> I was working for the federal government in the Department of Justice, and um, I was on assignment on, on official business in Chile, where I had lived previously. And so I had gone down a couple days before just to kind of like work with the embassy and see some friends. And I had been very, very sick on the way down. I ended up in the hospital when I got to Chile. It was pretty bad. So I was on an IV drip and I was totally delirious. And then the rest of my team, like uh, lawyers and stuff, they came down over the weekend and they wanted to go wine tasting. And here I was like, oh, please don't make me do anything besides stay in bed. And I had to go with them. So we ended up at this vineyard. I think it was in the Maipo Valley. I'm not sure. And we sat down and I was like, oh, I can't. And then five bottles of wine later, I was feeling a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> feeling so, good. So Chilean Merlot was like my crutch for the first couple years of my semi-wine drinking life. So that's that's the story of how I got into wine. <laughs> five bottles of Chilean Merlot later, I was feeling no pain. <laughs> yes. Have you been back to Chile since? I have. I have. That's actually the uh, the location of my embarrassing wine story that I will tell later. Oh. So yeah, I've been back a couple of times. Okay, that's going to yeah. be a treat. <laughs> well, well, tell us about Five Senses Tastings and really from the inside out with all of the details. And most of all, clue us into what a music tasting is. Stop me at any point here. I'll, I'll kind of start from the beginning, which was, you know, a number of years ago when I was living in New York in my, what, like third life. <laughs> um, so I, so after I worked for the government, I, I went to school and I became a professional opera singer and I was doing that for 
um, a number of years. And um, as my voice started to change and the economy was in real trouble, I realized that I wasn't really able to make ends meet. And so I began working at this startup company uh, in the localization and translation field, which is something I'm also very interested in and, and worked in. And sort of being in this startup environment was so invigorating, but I was still trying to be a singer and still trying to figure out in this time when all these small opera companies were, were folding, like what was the new language for music in this world, right? Also learning about wine at the same time. And I started kind of putting a lot of these concepts together. And I wondered, you know, was this flight of wine, this was this thing I loved. I started loving these flights of wine. I thought, is that something you could do with music? Could you taste music? And you know, people would always tell me when I was an opera singer, they'd like make this sort of crinkly face and they'd say like, oh, I'm so sorry, but I hate opera or <laughs> um, I hate white wine. And I'd be like, do you really like, do you really hate all opera and all white wine? Or is it like the really boring Pinot Grigio at Thanksgiving and like the long Wagner opera that your uncle made you sit through? Like, <laughs> is it that? <laughs> uh, and so I just started wondering how I could go about how putting these things together and, you know, all of the storytelling that I had been doing on stage, how would that fit into it? And so I kind of came up with this idea of tasting music, tasting a variety of different types of music while also tasting with the senses that we're used to tasting with through wine, cheese and chocolate. And that's kind of how it started. And then, you know, as I was working full time at this other company, I wasn't able to do this full time. So I do a few on the side, kind of testing the concept. I would do a few and then I would not do a few for a number of months. And as the time went on, I just realized that this is something, you know, tech, the technology world was not where I wanted to spend my life, although it was very interesting. And so about a year ago, I quit my job and moved to L.A. and relaunched the company uh, in L.A. Yeah, just over a year ago. Why did you pick L.A.? So I had been in the Bay Area for a little while and um, it, it didn't really, we didn't really fit too well together. And I started coming down to LA and what I really loved about it was this this feeling of, of you know, it's kind of true what people say, anything's possible in LA. People are so open to a new idea. I mean, six weeks after I drove into LA, I was, I was relaunching the company at Diane von Furstenberg because I talked to someone and she said, yes. Wow. And then I walked into a wine bar and a guy was like, oh, sure. What date would you like? I mean, this just kept <laughs> happening. And, you know, I just thought, well, I've never had this reception. People in L.A. are so intrigued by stuff they don't know about. It just seemed a perfect fit for me. I was very lucky. Have you been to the wine house? I just took my WSET level two there. I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> yes. That's a, that's a great facility. Wine store on the bottom and a restaurant and then up top is like classroom area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a it's a fantastic spot. I'm like this is like a dream classroom. Congratulations on that mm -hmm. and I'm sure you did fine on level 2. Now, your company, Five Senses Tastings, mm -hmm. you have a team of musicians. Is that how that works? Um, so I have a roster of musicians. Um, they are not the same musicians every time. So, you know, I've never held auditions. I knew enough people either in LA or through people I knew who were in L um, who were outside who knew people in LA that I've grown my roster completely organically. And, you know, to your question about what a music tasting is, you know, people ask a lot, you know, so you have a preformed band? And I'd say, no, we don't. We have individual musicians who are versatile enough to play a variety of genres. And in a given music tasting, at least in our traditional classic music tasting, um, we're working on some other formats, but the classic music tasting, you'll taste maybe five to eight different genres of music. So you need someone who's able to play, you know, jazz, country rock, opera, tango, flamenco, and blues, for example. And so a band, a preformed band, however versatile they may be, typically has one or, or two genres or, or focuses, you know, that, that they perform. And so my, the musicians that I work with are all active performing musicians around the state, country, and world who are interested also in kind of expanding and stretching their own capabilities to include something maybe they haven't done before. And that's what's really important to me and important to the audience, I think. Everybody is learning in this instance, me included, everybody. So a music tasting is really an experience or, or an, um, an opportunity for us to go beyond what we know and expand, uh, as we would at a wine tasting, expand beyond the, you know, I'm not drinking any Merlot. You know, <laughs> I'm not listening to any opera. Okay, we'll give you four minutes. That's it. Now, 
Now we'll give you some blues. Then we'll give you some tango. Just just taste it. You know, I'm kind of curious. I've got a Barolo here and I'm wondering where you would go with that. If I said, you know, I love Italian wines, got this Barolo. How does that work? I mean, can you kind of walk me through how you would work that out with a client? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a question I get a lot. And um, what the very small amount of literature that I have been able to find about pairing music and wine really focuses on, you know, one genre meets one wine. And while I think that's a great start, as I have just learned in my WSET class, you would never talk about a Chardonnay from Chablis the way you talk about a Chardonnay from Sonoma. They're completely different as it is from a start, Correct. right, from Australia. So, Given, as an example, how could you possibly say that Barolo was classical music, right? That's 700 years of music or something. So right. instead of saying a Barolo is X, I would say, well, talk to me about you know, why you have the Barolo, where it's from, how, who made it, why they made it. Does it evoke, um, it, you know, and then I get the tasting notes and I kind of work more for a story. So I'm working with a winery up in the Bay Area in August and they you know they gave me a, a Nebbiolo to work with and what came out was really what image the winemaker had and it was this sort of Italian muscular mustached Marlboro man and some other things he told me about the story his story and the wine story that to me was um, Piazzolla's Le Grand Tango, which is a 10 minute piece in which there are three separate sections each of which speaking to a part of the wine that he described to me. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Because every wine has a story. So you're trying to actually communicate that story, whether it's the winemaker's intention or the sense of place through a piece of music. Exactly. And, you know, recently, for example, we did a Women's History Month event and, you know, we were eight and they were all women winemakers. And so, for example, we started with a wine that was this woman's first wine she'd ever produced. And so our first song was Let Her Rip by Dixie Chicks, right? Let her rip, get her into the world. And then we followed that with a piece by a female composer in the French Romantic period that really spoke to the flavors of that wine. So there were two different things that we were, um, you know, putting out in the in the sort of musical identity of this wine. Oh, that is so interesting. That is so cool. What, can we get you out here in Colorado? Of course. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, so cool. We should try and yeah. come up with an event next time you're in Denver. I'd love it. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of what I'm working on, although I'm very dedicated to, to the live music element, right, that we've been talking about, is that this is something that you can do in your home with a little bit of guidance. So I'm working a lot on kind of making that a little bit more possible for a set of friends or, or you know, a couple couples to do in their own home. So that's that's, you know, kind of a, a lower, uh, lower burden kind of way to get this into your life and experiment. So yeah, like a playlist, like mm -hmm. Kala, you would have a, you would have a playlist that you would recommend based on some wines. Maybe you could even do the reverse. Somebody picks the playlist and then they go buy the wines or something. There are lots of ways to go about this. Um, and this is actually something that I'm working on with a chocolate company that I, I've begun a partnership with called Bitch Fix. And we're actually putting together packages of chocolate, wine, and musical pairing lists that go with the chocolate. And that's exactly what you're what you're saying, spot on. Yeah. Well, are you familiar with Krug's mm -hmm. app? Yeah. And so that same kind of thing where, you know, there's a playlist, you know, that's it really brings all of those experiences and the senses, five senses tastings, you know, all together, which is it's becoming, you know, it's not mainstream or anything and people are just starting to hear about it, but I, I think it's cutting edge of the next thing with wine. I completely agree. I, I read all the time about musicians who are partnering with wineries, um, you know, from, from someone up in Oregon, you may never have heard of to John Legend. So, you know, it is happening. And I think what they're getting at um, and what, what we're getting at at Five Senses is really this very, very simple idea of experiential marketing, which is experience over stuff, yes. right? We don't need any more stuff. No. Right. And no. experiences form part of our identity. That becomes part of our life. And so as it is with, you know, when we do tastings for luxury brands, you know, we hope that you buy a product that becomes part of your life and your experience, not just the product itself. And so if we can create that more full sensory experience for you, we believe that you're your life with that product or with that moment in time will be richer. 
as a result. I have to ask you, because I was working out this morning to some harder rock, if you want to classify Bob Seger and some uh, David Coverdale. And do you work outside the wine realm? Do you go into the spirits? Because I'm like, oh, yeah, I could see this with a bourbon. And, you know, I don't know. Do you go outside of the wine world and, and play with other spirits or liqueurs or anything like that? That is totally my plan. It has not come up yet, but I have had some talks with um, spirit ambassadors and spirit brands. Um, I'm actually talking to someone in the cocktail world right now about something um, very early stages, so can't really uh, say a lot about it. We're just kind of playing around, but absolutely 100%. And I think I think it was your guest who was talking about the millennial age a couple weeks ago. Uh, John. Yeah, the thirsty nest. Yeah, we were just think- I was just thinking. Oh, Andrew. Andrew. Oh, Andrew. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he made this really interesting point, I thought, about how, uh, this is how I remember it, is that, you know, going out for a cocktail is an experience. And mm-hmm. what I heard, which he didn't say, but when I was thinking, I was thinking, okay, bringing a bottle of wine into your home, yes, it's an experience, but it is different. And so I thought it was very interesting how he juxtaposed that sort of idea of going outside and how the cocktail was was sort of a, a larger step for people to make than just going to get a glass of wine. And because of that, maybe that um, that element of putting all these things together. And so, you know, as a sort of an experience seeker myself, um, this idea of putting all these elements together in one, you know, music, wine, cheese, chocolate, that's the good stuff. You know, it's it's putting all the things together that you wouldn't necessarily think of what you do in a cocktail. Right. Right. Well, my husband, I have to say this, my husband's like nickname is the experience collector. And, nice. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really kind of cute because he's finally on um, Instagram and Twitter and stuff now as the experience collector. And it's cool, though, but you're right. I mean, that's that's where it's going. And you've said a couple of things that you're working on and um, alluded to some projects that you've got your hands in. Is there anything else on on the horizon for Five Senses Tastings that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, August uh, is really busy for us. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to share. So we will be up in the Bay Area at Domenico Winery, which is in San Carlos on the South Bay um, on August 5th for um, a wine tasting dinner. Um, And then something I'm super duper excited about, uh, we just finalized the date. Um, I think it's going to be August 23rd, possibly 24th. We are going to be at Bar and Garden, which is a wine shop and event space in Culver City, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So partnering with them and then partnering with a hospitality partner slash high-end caterer called uh, Schaefer L.A., And we are going to be debuting a new event format, which is still to be titled, um, but involves blindfolding guests and asking them to taste only with their ears at first. So playing them a piece of music with their with their blindfolds on and no food or wine there and then opening up their other four senses sort of uh, en masse and replaying the piece of music with all five senses engaged and then talking about how the perception changes. So we're. Really I love that. Excited That's, about that. Woohoo! That <laughs> sounds really cool. I'm like, I'm imagining that you had a really good description of it. So I'm kind of imagining it in my head going, now that really is how you become so mindful of what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, that's the hope. And I think, you know, the the blindfold idea is not necessarily new to, um, you know, there's the, um, I can't remember what it's called, the blind dinners. They have a name that's really cool that I can't remember. Um, But the idea that you blindfold yourself and then eat, which is also fascinating. But I think, you know, our sense of sound is a sense that we are so used to relegating to the background. And one of the main points that we put out there is that sound you know, is, is a, is one of our oldest senses. There are mammals born without eyes, but they hear, right? Sound music was communication before it was entertainment. And so to accept that it should remain in the background of our sensory experience does not make sense to me. And so we try, we, we try, we do bring sound into the foreground. And so this idea of shutting out the rest of the world that we are totally in tune with sensing all day long, our touch, our sight, our smell, our taste, and just focusing on sound, that's new. And that's what we're really excited about. Well, this is going to go off really well when I serve up a blindfold for dinner tonight <laughs> and say, hang on, honey. 
<laughs> oh, I kidding. bet he'll get really excited, Val. He'd be like, "What? Yeah, get doing? get the iTunes. Here's a blindfold. What's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> do it. Tell me how it goes." <laughs> oh my gosh, Kala, that is so cool. Thank but you. you know, wh- what you do does sound like a lot of fun. But do you do anything that's not related to wine when it comes to fun? Well, so luckily for me, my uh, my company does involve pretty much everything I love. But you know, the other part of my life that is has always been a part of my life is singing. So. Um, I do still sing classical, classically and, and opera. Last week, we, a fr- couple friends uh, and I put together a benefit concert for the ACLU on which I sang. And then uh, I do sing with a couple uh, wonderful chorales in L.A., um, one of whom I actually just asked me to sing on one of their performances at Hollywood Bowl. Uh, not as a soloist, but I will be singing at the Hollywood Bowl, which is very cool. Other than that, I'm still getting to know L.A. You know, it's still it's such a huge place. Like, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I just get in my car and like, drive northeast and see where I go. (laughs) Well, and you mentioned in your bio that you're a bone marrow donor. So I really want to know why that's so important to you and how it's become part of your human fabric. Uh, Well, thank you so much for asking that question. And I, I absolutely love the way you put that question. And it is probably the single most important thing I will ever do with my life. And what I find so humbling about it is that I have nothing to do with it. Just the fact that I was born somehow by some, you know, magic of chance and availability and scientific wonder helped save a woman's life. And that will never cease to be amazing to me. And, you know, I struggled a lot when I was going through the process of donation of people calling me a hero because it felt really wrong. And it didn't feel like that at all. It felt like an incredibly intimate experience, something that nobody else could really understand. And it wasn't heroic. It was just human. You know, the reason that I ended up on the the, the marrow registry, which I will share and hope that, you know, your listeners will, will perk up at, is that I cannot donate bone, um, I cannot donate blood because I lived in Europe at a certain point yeah. and for many other reasons you cannot donate blood but the process for donating blood and bone marrow is different so you can if you are under the age of 44 join the registry the other thing i learned was that when i was donating i was told a story of a woman who backed out from being a donor because she did not want her wedding pictures to show her you know the green spots on your hand when you donate blood and i remember being so heartbroken by that because i think people see it as, you know, hey, I'm going to go do this great thing. And then they never think they'll be called because they probably won't. But when you are called, if you don't step up, that is so much more heartbreaking to the families than if you hadn't joined in the beginning. So I think it is really, um, you know, you have to go inside yourself and see if you're ready to perform that act for another human, kind of no matter what. And if you are, then please join. It is the most... I guess just humbling and uh, special and intimate thing I've ever done. And it will, I think about it on some level every single day of my life. And when did you do that? Um, November 17th of eight and 18th of 2003. So almost 14 years ago. Okay. And she's still alive. That's just amazing. That's so cool. And I, I practiced oncology pharmacy for a while. So I realize how important that is. So thank you so much. For sharing yes, all absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. I, I really appreciate it. It's an important thing. And I think a lot of people don't, you know, Robin Roberts did an amazing job of publicizing this to the country. I really commend her for that. But it's still something that people don't think of right away. They think of blood donation, yeah, of course, but but bone marrow donation, then they only think about what they hear about um, the painful extraction through the hip, um, which is not what mm-hmm. I underwent. I actually underwent it really completely painless extraction. And so that's also for people to know that it can be done very painlessly as well. Well, it's also interesting to know that if you cannot donate blood, I'm actually one of those people as well because of where I've lived and have traveled to, Mm -hmm. but did not know that you could donate bone marrow. Yes. So Mm -hmm. that's something new. And of course you get, you said you've got to be under 44. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. They changed the age. It used to be 62 or 65 and they changed it um i think also platelets you might be able to donate as well um i should check on that to make sure but i believe platelets are also um separate from the uh, blood pro- blood donation process and, and i have a funny story about the blood donation process and about blood dripping my down my arm in a mall in alabama <laughs> but i would rather hear your embarrassing wine story if we can just lighten up and go back to chile chile sure so it's um 
So when you asked me this question, I was like, oh, God, I really don't have one. And I was like, well, maybe I can bend the rules a little. It's not exactly embarrassing about wine. It's about how I was embarrassed in a moment and wine helped. So that's... (laughs) (laughs) Hey, that'll work. (laughs) So in 2010, if you'll recall, was the horrific earthquake in Chile, which resulted in the tsunami that um, devastated many parts of the country, right? And one of the parts of the country that was devastated is this tiny little island called Juan Fernandez, or also known as Robinson Crusoe Island out in the Pacific. So it's not as far out as Easter Island, but it's it's very small. It has about 800 inhabitants and no one's ever heard of it. And you you fly in and you can't even get to the town overland. You have to go around in a boat and it's this just crazy place. And so uh, some friends and I in New York had organized a benefit recital and we raised a lot of money and it was decided that we would help rebuild the school on this island. So I had gone down there um, to visit some friends and I had some connections to the diplomatic community. So um, the president of Chile at the time, Sebastián Pineda, actually went to the island and he had asked my friends and by extension me to join so I, I flew out there on really the tiniest plane I've ever seen and never want to be on again. <laughs> and I land there and he kind of like a couple hours later, he's like zipping around the corner. He wanted to drive the boat and he rides up and he's like, Donde está la soprano? And I was like, um, I think that's me. Hi, I'm here. And so the day went on and his people asked me to join them on the Navy ship for dinner. And of course, we're all in like rain gear, earthquake gear, like everyone's in hiking boots. No one. I mean, we were all dirty. So I get on this boat and he's like, I want you to sing for us. And I was like, oh, God. And I was panicked. I was so nervous. And I was talking to one of the staff on the boat. I was like, I cannot believe I'm about to sink the breath in that. I'm so nervous. And he's like, he beckons me over. He's like, here. And he gives me this glass of wine. And I chug this glass of wine. <laughs> I was like, oh God, please give me liquid, liquid nerves, you know? And the boat's rocking and my knees are shaking and I'm like forgetting all my words. I'm just uttering some sort of French sounding syllables that sound like <laughs> Carmen. And- <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got through it, but I just remember this guy, come on over, come here. And he like gives me this glass of wine to, you know, because we weren't eating, you know, fancy dinners or drinking wine. It was this sort of rescue mission boat thing on Navy ship in the middle of the ocean. And I just remember that guy and his glass of wine. So that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> that was <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, you do you do need sometimes the liquid courage and the uh, the wine to help you. At least, you know, at least it was there for you when you needed it. Exactly. It's a it's a reliable friend. That's right. That's oh right. My gosh. Well, so you told us how people could find you and your music at mm-hmm. callamaxim.com, but tell us how everybody can connect with you for Five Senses Tasting. Sure. So our website is Five Senses Tastings. That's all written out. So the, the letters F-I-V-E, Senses Tastings with an S on the end, dot com. On social, we're actually the number five Senses Tastings on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, I think on Facebook, we're also written out. But if you just type uh, Five Senses Tastings, you'll find us. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. No problem, Kala. Yep, I think we are engaged there, so. and mm-hmm. we will definitely keep in touch for sure. This Thank was you, great too. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh my gosh, what an absolute pleasure and treat! And thank you. And um, yeah, it's just uh, so much has happened this this year for us, and, and just really grateful for it and appreciate it. And yeah, I'm I'm super psyched to be uh, to be on. Thank you, thank you so much. And I I will let you know when I'm next in Denver. I'm thinking of a trip. Um, maybe in um, August or September. So I'll certainly let you know. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, cool. And just congratulations on the success of your business so far. I mean, such a short period of time. That's really cool. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's You guys know it is hard work, but it's the payoff is pretty cool. Yep. That's what you do when you do what you love. That's right. (laughs) Thank you so much, Kala. Oh, thank you both. And have a wonderful uh, July 4th next week. All right, you too. Okay. Take care then. Wow. That was that was so much fun. I learned a lot, not just about Kala, but just kind of about being blindfolded. <laughs> I know. That was so yeah, funny. That was so funny. I love that. <laughs> it's like, oh, that, really... that puts a whole new spin on dinner. What's for dinner? I don't know. Just sit down. I got a blindfold. Get me the iTunes. <laughs> I just, 
you know what also I really liked about what she said was um, how one glass of wine could be multiple songs. And you're experiencing that same glass of wine through different genres of music. And I just thought, I have never taken the time to really have that experience. So now I definitely uh, will pay more attention to to that. And um, the other thing I, I really wanted, I wish I had asked her, I, and we would go too long probably, but when she was talking about they have an event coming up with a dinner party, and I wanted to know, like, how does the music get inserted into the dinner party? You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah, I, th- I would be interested to hear more about that as well, about how she goes through the process. But I can see where it'd be pretty involved. And, and I can also see how a wine can be paired with, if you will, you know, with different kinds of music. Cause don't you think like this Barolo at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon on a warm Colorado summer day is going to be different in my glass than it is on a cool evening in front of a fire with maybe, uh, you know, a big plate of, uh, risotto milanese or something. Yeah. You can see how a glass of wine can evoke different emotions or different experiences. Cause she's into the experience creation realm just like when she says people say they don't like white wine it's like well right they don't all this doesn't come in one flavor or even you know sensory experience you know some wines are very high in acid and very zingy and you can see where there'd be a lot of strings and and high tones to pair with that wine where if you got like she said a chardonnay from chablis versus a chardonnay from sonoma or something that spent time in wood and you can probably find yourself going down the scale a bit i don't know i'm kind of guessing but based on what she's told us but it was a really great interview and so good to have her on here stuff so thank you for inviting her i she was delightful and we definitely encourage listeners that you go check out her page and check out her music and check her out at the hollywood bowl if you're going to be there in august and listen to her sing yeah yeah Yeah. lots of cool stuff happening with uh kala and with her business so uh please follow up with her and and uh follow what she's doing absolutely i say that a lot on this show but Oh, what's next? Factoid? Yeah, let's give it out a factoid. We talked a couple weeks ago about mezcal and how it's different from tequila. Well, there are other agave-ish beverages or spirits out there. Uh, one of them's Bacanora, but then there's another one called Sotol. And this one I got introduced to a couple years ago, and it's one that you don't hear about. And I think what drew my attention to it, because I always picture this one producer has it in a round bottle, was the floral aspect of the Satol when I lined it up against a mezcal and a tequila. So if you're not familiar with Satol, it is spelled S-O-T-O-L, and it is made from a plant called a desert spoon. There is a Latin term for it, but I won't go into that. But it's it's desert spoon, or in Spanish, they call it sotol. And these are like these big stick-like looking plants, and, and I'm making the arm mo- movements like you guys can see me. <laughs> they grow in not only the Chihuahua state of Mexico, they also grow in parts of Texas as well. But these plants grow, and it, at least in Chihuahua, Durango and this other state, uh, Wawila. It's spelled C-O-A-H-U-I-L-A. So yes, the Mexican states of Chihuahua, Durango, and Wawila. It is the, it is actually, Wawila. It is actually the state drink, at least in Chihuahua. They call it the state drink. I don't think Colorado has a state drink unless it's beer. But these beer. plants are very slow to grow. This is the interesting thing about these plants. So they take about 12 years or up to 15 years before you can actually harvest them to produce sotol. And you can only get like one liter of sotol per plant. So like one plant, that's a bottle pretty much or, you know, two bottles, whatever. This is probably very limited the so tall. I mean, yeah, I don't see it a lot. I think my favorite beer store does carry it and it's the only bottle of it I've ever seen. But what's interesting also about it is that it is not part of the agave family. So I want to put this video up of somebody talking about Sotol, but they keep saying it's agave. It used to be part of agave family, but apparently it was reclassified. 
So it's part of another family, and I can link that up to you guys so you can see it. It's still part of the succulent family. That's the thing. But it is not technically agave. And that's the thing about tequila. Tequila has to be made with a certain species of blue agave. So like tequila and like mezcal, the Satol also comes in different styles, like the silver or plata, which is the unaged. It also has a reposado, in this case, up to a year in wood. And then it does have an añejo, which ages for at least a year. And of course, in 2004 is when it's received its Mexican D.O., so it's not international, it's a Mexican D.O., and that's also when the Consejo Mexicano de Sotol was formed. And that's like last week we talked about IGPs for lemons. This is like their regulatory commission. They've got a cons- consorcio in Italian. It's the uh, the Consejo in Spanish. So they've got that. And that regulates the production and all that. And like I mentioned, the Sotol is produced in three states in Mexico, Chihuahua, Durango, and Wawila. So we'll put mm. some links up that we found are very interesting. And there's a really cool PowerPoint, an agave intensive uh, presentation from Arthur Black. And we've mentioned him before, how funny this dude is. But you guys can check out his presentation. There's a link to it on the Society of Wine Educators page. And we'd love for you to check it out. And if you've had it, or if you can add something to the conversation, please let us know. Yeah, leave us a speak pipe or put something on Facebook and tell us your story about Sotol. Yep. What else we've got? That's kind of like a radar, but there's something else on our radar, too. Okay, so it was a factoid wino radar combo. (laughs) And we have more wino radar because there's always so much more out there. There is, and we can't cover it all. But what we can cover is this interesting tour that's coming up in November of 2017 from the 19th through the 26th. It's called Thanksgiving in Piemonte. And I think it's called like turkey and truffles because you're going to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're going to be in Piemonte for Thanksgiving. And, and I love to leave the country for Thanksgiving. And I would like to, <laughs> I would like to stay gone till April if I could. That was my original plan for getting my town citizenship was to like not be in the country for half the year, particularly during the holidays. And this is an all inclusive tour. It includes all accommodations at Marchese Alfieri. They have all your breakfasts, lunches, all your daily aperitivi, all your dinners throughout the entire tour. All the tastings, the shuttle service to the, they have different itinerary destinations, tour guides, and it's all included. So it's kind of like, they're calling it like a, a land cruise. So it's kind of like oh. when you go on a cruise and you yeah. don't need to take your wallet out of the safe, which is how, you know, which is kind of fun. It's kind of like that. And of course, your guide is going to be Suzanne Hoffman, and she is the author of the Wine Families book that we've talked about on the show, Labor of Love, Wine Family Women of Pimante. And she's very familiar with this region. As you can imagine, the wines, she knows the families behind the wines. You're going to get a taste. And actually, you can see this long list of wines. And, and I'll send a link to the attachment there to the uh, tour. But Undiscovered Sojourns is doing this tour. And you can reserve your spot by contacting Suzanne at winefamilies.com. That so sounds pretty awesome. It does. I mean, like I said, I wish I wish I could go because, <laughs> of course, then I would like go look for somewhere else to go after that. Not want to come back till you know April, May. <laughs> but what about shout outs? Oh, shout outs! Talking about daily aperitivi, you know what's a great place to go have aperitivi when you are traveling about is Vino Volo at so many airports. Mm -hmm. You can check out where they are ahead of time. I don't even know how many locations they have, but I luck out and there's one most airports I go to. Justin and I hit up the Vino Volo at the Portland PDX airport. And I was waiting for my members only little wine taster. And I was thinking about our wine two fivers, thinking about you guys saying, If they don't know about Vino Volo, they need to. And I think I've mentioned it at least once before, and I know Val has too because we both love them. But, you know, Vino Volo deserves a shout out because they, they have such great food. They have outstanding wine selection. The app is really easy to use on your phone. Like, I had it already pulled up, and 
like the guy comes over, our server comes over and he's like, oh, I see that you've got the app. Let me get you your tasters. And, and like off they go with this great service, great stemware, you know, everything about it, they're doing right. And one thing too, is that you can buy a bottle of wine there Mm -hmm. and, and take it home with you. Okay. So you're not going to be like drinking it on the plane, but you can buy a bottle of wine, even though you're already at your gate, you know, you can buy a bottle of wine and either I was thinking, well, maybe I'll buy some Oregon wine to like drink with some of my FOCO wine geeky friends, you know, or something, but you know, you can throw it with you in your carry on bag Mm -hmm. and bring something home, uh, as a gift to yourself. Hey, you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of cool things about Vino Volo. So check them out. I think they deserve uh, some kudos. You know, I Vino Volo is and it's we're not doing an ad for them. We just love them. And I think the name of their facility should actually be called because layovers shouldn't suck. But they are in all these different airports. And I actually like at the end of an exam or whatever. I know like when I was flying in and out of seeing it was a uh Orange County, I would get to the airport early when I was flying home so I could sit at Vino Volo, order some wine and have a snack before I got on whatever flight was bringing me back to Colorado. And I have to tell you one quick Vino Volo story. So right after I took the CSW back in 2012, I was flying out of uh, San Francisco and I left the exam room and I wasn't sure how I did, but I thought, well, it's over. It doesn't matter. My flight doesn't leave for like four hours, but I want to beat San Francisco traffic. And I like, I head, I go through Oakland, I go across the Bay Bridge, I get to San Francisco airport. I'm like three hours early for my flight and I'm in the terminal that doesn't have the Vino Volo. So I actually have to leave security. (laughs) <laughs> take a train go to the other terminal go through security again and i get to the guy and he looks at my boarding pass because you know you're in the wrong terminal i'm like well yeah but this is the terminal with the wine bar and the yoga studio and i've got three hours till my next flight so he lets me in so i go there and i have a nice flight of wine i have my lunch <laughs> I, you know i got two hours i read a book and then i go back out of security across to the other terminal, back through security. So I have to go through security three times just to drink (laughs) at Vino Volo. That's how good they are. Damn it. Oh, my God. Vino Volo disciple. (laughs) That's cool. I do like that. They've got a good thing going, and um, the app is really cool, too. So I think we better thank our Patreons now. Yeah, we should. We should. Uh, We're thanking our Patreon supporters profusely because you're kind of our sponsors, really. So our tenacious tasters are Jeff E. from the We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, and our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners. Thank you, Meg from South Dakota, Clay from Arizona, John in California, Andrew in Illinois, Aswani in California, and Chantel in Ontario. And you too can jump on the Patreon bandwagon because if you like what you hear, you like spending time with our Wine to Five community, then why not buy us a glass of wine? It would be like we're hanging out at Vino Volo. I know. That'd be so cool. That'd be cool. cool. And why else would you become a Patreon supporter? Well, you get all kinds of little perks like early releases of episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, and we cannot forget the swag. All right. And since it's still June as of this recording, we will be drawing for our surprise wine gift for any Patreon supporter at the $2 tastemaker level and higher next week. So that will air uh, mid-July. That will air mid-July. So you'll find out who wins for July. And if you want to get in on the monthly wine goodies, go to our Patreon page for details. That's www.patreon.com slash wine25podcast. And please share the Wine 2 Five podcast with your friends on social media. You can tweet it, Facebook it. Um, we've been using the hashtag Wine 2 Five podcast on Instagram. So we really would like people to um, join the community and keep the conversations going about wine and sharing all of the fun pictures. You can also help someone you know uh, subscribe to 
subscribe to the podcast on, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, iHeartRadio. You can even show them how to write a review. And you can write one, too. We... <laughs> <laughs> we love all of the we love all the support and all the reviews, you guys. It really makes our day, and uh, it encourages us to keep doing what we're doing every week for you guys. And um, another way that you can help support our show is by shopping in our Wine Two Five store. That's on our website. All of the links to our social media sites are on the website as well. We're on Facebook, Twitter. Pinterest, YouTube, and Google Plus. Everything is under the wine, T W O F I V E. Um, and then if you want to connect with Val, she's on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed. And she is Vino with Val on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as The Wine Heroine. And you can also connect with me personally on Facebook. So thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Kala. And until next week, everybody, cheers. cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips. Tips.